Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, okay, so in this audio message, I just want to give you a detailed introduction of myself. Who am I and how did I come to Tafsir in the first place? Um, in the first 18 years of my life, I spent it abroad. Um, it was not in Pakistan. My father, he was a professor in physics and computer engineering. So we were in Singapore, we were in Malaysia, we were in Hong Kong, um, in, in many countries, but not Pakistan. And when I was 18 years old, because I was the kind of student who was a nerd, I still am a nerd. So I had no interest in music or in movies or in anything else. I was just that very, very annoying, very competitive student who has to ace the exam, who has to be number one. And that's the kind of annoying person that I was and I actually still am. Uh, and so, um, you know, I was, the student who had to do good, but also the student who had planned her entire life. So I had planned my career, I had planned everything, and I always wanted to be a teacher. Um, so I had planned that, okay, I'll get my degrees and then I'll be a, an instructor in some university. And this is what my plan was ever since I was 10 or 11 years old. Um, I have one brother, he's older than me, he's uh, three years older than me, and it's just me and him and that's it. Um, so even when I was uh, six, seven years old, I would take my dolls and I would put them in front of me and I would pretend that they were my students and I was a teacher and I would start teaching them. And then my brother would walk in and he would bash up all the dolls and I would start crying and screaming. So that was basically the kind of person I was that very, very ambitious, very focused, very sure of what I wanted in life and uh, very much a nerd. So when I was 18 years old, um, I did, I did uh, very well in my O-levels and in my A-levels, and so I got a scholarship from the London School of Economics. Uh, and since I was in love with economics, it was a huge thing to get a scholarship uh, in the LSE program. The, first of all, they don't give scholarships, so the fact that at that time, and I'm talking about 1998, so the fact that at that time they were offering me a scholarship, it was because I'd done really well, and so it was a dream come true for me. But my father said, no, you have to go back to Pakistan because um, I did not know anything about the Pakistani culture, the Pakistani language, the Pakistani people. And my connection with Allah till then was that I did believe in Allah. Um, I used to pray maybe once a day or maybe once a week. I mean, that, that was it. My parents would pray every day, five times a day, but they would never pressurize me because when you're living abroad, and you have all kinds of friends, then it's very dangerous to pressurize your kids, right? Because then if the kids get sick and tired, they might just run away from home, they might just become an atheist. So they never pressurized me. And the interesting thing uh, is that throughout those 18 years, my friends were not Muslims, of course, okay? So I had friends who were uh, Hindu, I had friends who were atheists, I had friends who were, uh, who were Christians, and all my friends, of course, they were into all kinds of things. So they were into um, they were into alcohol, they were into drugs, they had boyfriends, um, they had all of that stuff. And of course, I had been told by my parents from the very first day that I cannot have any of that. So I cannot have a boyfriend, I cannot get myself into drugs or into alcohol. <clears throat> so if I ever had to make a plan to go out with my friends, um, they were given specific instructions that while I am with them, they cannot call their boyfriends. But as soon as we have finished watching the movie or as soon as we have finished having lunch and I come back home, then their boyfriends can come along and join them. So it was, it was actually quite humiliating because all my friends hated me for this reason. And I just, I didn't know why I could not have that kind of life. You know, so that kind of, it, it seemed very attractive, it seemed fun that they could do you know, everything and anything. And I was told that I could do nothing. So um, there were all these restrictions that, they, that were imposed upon them because of me. And it, you know, it made me actually get very annoyed with Islam. I could not understand it. And my parents, although, you know, they were into Islam and into the prayers, they had not studied tafsir, so they didn't themselves know why these things are wrong. 
you know, it's like they had been taught by their parents that these things are wrong, so they were just passing on the information. But, um, you know, when we would, uh, when I would ask them that, why is it wrong? Why can I not, you know, have alcohol? Why can I, can I not go out with my friends? Why can I not have boyfriends? Um, there was just no answer because they would just tell me, well, because Allah says it's wrong. And, you know, for a child who's very, who's very intellectual, who's very much into studies, who's very much into reason and logic, that was the worst answer that you could give her. So for those 18 years, I couldn't do any of those things. And my friends, of course, you know, they would have all kinds of questions. So they would, um, they would say, oh, you know, your Islam, it seems so difficult. You know, I think you'll have to live like this for the rest of your life. You know, you'll never be able to experience joy or happiness. And I would listen to what they had to say and I would actually feel that, yeah, I think that's what my life is going to be like. It's going to be horrible because apparently that's Islam. Uh, and so at the age of 18, my father decided, okay, you cannot go to London because I guess, you know, he was, mashallah, say very smart. So he understood that I'll just become a nerve wreck if I'm sent to London. So he decided that, no, um, you have to come to Pakistan. So at the age of 18, I came to Pakistan. I, um, I moved here with my mother. My, my brother had gone to the U.S. for his studies, but I came here. And uh, I joined LUMS, uh, the Lahore University of Management Sciences. Um, of course, brilliant university, but because I hated, um, I hated Pakistan. So for the first year, I didn't make friends. I didn't talk to anyone. Um, I actually became, uh, I became anorexic. So I stopped eating. I lost 20, 25 kilos. I was complete bones. And the idea was I was trying to torture my parents because I wanted them to uh, get me out of Pakistan and let me go to you know my dream university and so on. And of course, it didn't work. So I eventually, um, you know, over time as I started to, um, you know, make friends and I started to give Pakistan and Lums a chance, I started to enjoy it. I started to like the people because um, when you are abroad and you've spent a number of years abroad, the one thing that you are told, I'm not talking about right now, I'm talking about the 1990s. The one thing that you are told is Pakistan is a third world country. <clears throat> it's a developing nation. Nobody knows how to speak English. Um, you know, people live in mud houses. So it's like a very poor country. And that's what is fed into you for a very, very long period of time. It's like this brainwashing that is done. So you can imagine that when I came to Pakistan, even though I saw lums and I saw these amazing houses and these very smart people, I had been indoctrinated for so many years. I kept thinking, no, these, these students are just not good enough. They're not intellectual. They barely know how to speak English. Um, these people are very backward. You know, they're very conservative. And then after a year, I was forced to change my beliefs because I realized that the students here are smarter than I am. Their English is better than mine. These people are more educated and more well-groomed than even I am. And so then after a year, you know, I started to open up. I started to um, um, change my beliefs and my mindset. And then, then I made friends and then I, I fell in love with Pakistan. I fell in love with Lums. And so um, during that time, what happened was <clears throat> my connection with Islam was still not very well. Because as I told you, so many questions, none of my questions were being answered. And so <clears throat> my mother, um, she started studying with Dr. Israel's daughter. And so she was very concerned about me because I was not doing my prayers and I just wasn't interested. So I would drive to Lums, which was around a 30 minute drive every day. And I would always listen to music. And so what my um, incredibly smart mother, what she decided to do was she took um, some tapes which had Dr. Farad Hashmi's lectures inside them. And th these were lectures about Allah and Islam and so on. And she just put them in my car and she removed all the tapes that had music. So when I started the car and I started my journey, I would put in one tape and it's Dr. Farad Hashmi. Then I would, I would take it out, put in the second tape, again Farad Hashmi. Take it out, put in the third tape, again Farad Hashmi. So I was stuck with Farad Hashmi for my 40 minute journey. And so I, I had nothing else to do, I started listening. And you know, it was, it was not the seed. It was just basic about Allah and Islam and about namaz. And that was the first time I had heard uh, a scholar talk about Islam. 
and I, I liked what she had to say. So she spoke about you know, our connection with Allah and the reason why namaz is important and Allah is the creator and so on and so forth. And it just, it just hit me really hard in the heart. And I don't know why, because to be honest, um, I still had many questions that were not being answered. But just hearing what she had to say about Allah, the creator, the owner, the sustainer, and how we are his slaves, it just had a very strong impact on me. And I decided, um, after a couple more weeks of listening to Farid Hashmi, I decided, okay, I'm going to start my five-time prayers. And I told myself, it won't just be like one prayer and then two prayers and then three prayers. I'm going to dive in and just do my five-time prayers. And you know, when you're very, very passionate about something and you're very determined and you really change your mindset and your beliefs and you're able to do it. And I have always been that kind of a person that, you know, until I'm not convinced of something, I won't do it. But the minute I become convinced, then I change myself completely overnight. So at that moment, I became convinced and I started doing my five-time prayers. And, then, and since the age of 19, then I did not let go. Um, you know, I, regardless of what happened, regardless of the difficulties I faced, even though I still did not have an answer to my questions, I still had not studied tafsir, I never let the five-time prayers go because I had just told myself I'm doing this and nothing's going, going to take this away from me. So my mother's dream was fulfilled. My five-time prayer started. I was fasting in any case and, and uh, of course I believed in one God. But I would not come near Quran. I would not come near tafsir. And I wouldn't come near it because, again, being a nerd, being someone who was uh, always into studies and things that I found very difficult in, in, in intellectual subjects, you know, they really intrigued me. I just had this weird uh, assumption that the Quran is a very simple book. You know, it's about prophets, um, it, the things that happened in the past. It's about belief in one God. It's about halal and haram. There is nothing intellectual about it. So without even giving it a shot, I just uh, believed this assumption and I never approached the Quran. And of course, when I came to Pakistan, you have all these scholars who are talking about the seer and I just wouldn't listen to it because I just was not interested. And then uh, once I completed my bachelor's, I was around 21, 22 years old and I had done brilliant, uh, alhamdulillah, I had a four GPA, um, I was doing excellent. And of course, um, I then started to plan for my master's degree, that I have to get that, then I have to have my dream career and everything. And that is when my entire life story changed. Because up until then, everything was going great. You know, I had started to do my five-time prayers. Um, I believed I was a good Muslim, to some extent at least. Uh, I was great in my studies. Uh, and I had, I had done brilliant at, at, at LUMS. And then there was this proposal that came along. And so the proposal was also, um, it was from some family, their son, and you know, he's a doctor and whatnot. And it appeared to be great. So, you know, it's one of those things where you just tick all the boxes and it seems like, oh, your life is going amazing. Everything seems to be going as planned, it's brilliant. Now, I, of course, did not want to get married because I wanted to have my master's degree. I wanted to pursue my career. And then this marriage has just come out of nowhere. But, um, you know, I was told that, okay, uh, you can shift to America. And when you move to the U.S., you can continue studying over there. So it was, oh, brilliant. This is a dream come true for me. Um, and that is when my entire life changed. So uh, I was around 22 years old. That marriage lasted approximately three months, but there was so much emotional abuse involved in that, um, that it wasn't just emotional abuse, but I was isolated, so I was not permitted to talk to anyone. Uh, I was not permitted to have friends. Uh, I didn't have a phone. I didn't have a laptop. I had no means of communicating to anyone or even getting help from someone. So it was like three months that you're in prison, you're in jail, basically. And so, um, you know, at the end of those three month period for someone like me who has always been in charge of my life, always very ambitious, I started to have suicidal thoughts. And I then started my istikhara for the first time because I just could not take it. And I was afraid that I would do something to myself. So um, long story short, eventually my brother who was in the US, I was secretly able to communicate to him. I was able to send him a message asking him for help. 
And uh, then he um, came over and he kind of had to kidnap me and get me out of that place. So, you know, it was very, very, very traumatizing. It was an extremely traumatizing moment. And for someone, you know, who's had a pretty much perfect life, this was huge. You know, and then, of course, when you come back to Pakistan, um, in the Pakistani culture, it's a, it's a taboo to be divorced. Okay, it's not seen as a good thing. So, of course, that is one thing that I had to then come back and deal with. But then the issue was that since I, I was always ambitious about my dream, the only way of getting myself out of depression and to overcome this trauma was to get myself back into study. So I went back into LUMS. I pursued my MSc economics program. Uh, I, I, got a, I became a gold medalist in the program, I did brilliant, alhamdulillah, with the help of Allah. It was, it was great. But because I was back into my studies and back into pursuing my dream and my ambition, um, I was able to somehow overcome the trauma. But what I didn't realize is that when you go through a trauma, you can do things like studying and so on to try and change your mind, you know, to try and distract yourself. But the, it has a strong impact on you on the inside. That doesn't go away very easily. Studies will not take that away. The studies is a distraction. You have to solve the thing that's inside of you that's bothering you. And at times it, hit, it affects you at a subconscious level. So you are not aware of it, but you start acting weird. You start doing things in a very weird way. And it's because it's affected you at a subconscious level. And I didn't realize that. Um, so once uh, I had completed my degree, the LUMS, um, the LUMS dean offered me a job in the economics faculty. So now I'm a teacher, I'm a professor at LUMS. Again, dream come true, that's exactly what I wanted when I was 10 years old, and Allah gave it to me. So now, basically, I have everything that I, uh, that I could possibly want. But after a year of teaching, of making money, of having all this fame because you're a professor at LUMS, um, I just... I realized I'm not happy. I mean, this is the one thing that I was chasing all my life. I finally got it and I'm just not happy. And that's what made things very confusing for me because first of all, um, I still had this traumatizing effect from my first marriage. So many unanswered questions which I could not, which I needed answers to. Like the fact that, you know, Allah, I am a Muslim. I was doing my five time prayers. I, I abstained from drugs, alcohol, boyfriends, all the stuff that my friends were doing. I, I, I tried my best to adjust in Pakistan and to be a good person and to be obedient to my parents. Why did you let this happen to me? You know, so that I needed an answer to that question, which of course nobody could give me. And you know, when you ask people, the one answer that normally people say is that, oh, it's a test, it's a hardship, and uh, just you have to show sabr. But I could not understand how does Allah work? If He wants me to pray to Him and I am praying to Him, then why would he do this to me? You know, so there was this huge question that I was very upset with, and I needed an answer to that. And plus, there was the fact that I realized now I have fame, I have money, I have everything. Why am I not satisfied with this? Why is it not enough for me? And so while I was doing all of these things, I continued on with my teaching, but I just became more and more sad, more and more depressed, because uh, I would show this great, happy face to everyone but on the inside I just wasn't happy and then and, you know as I was struggling to get answers to these questions I had a series of more tests that were thrown at me a test that went on for the next 15 years it was one test after the next after the next to the extent that I couldn't even breathe um, there was just no time to breathe and it, it was like Allah just threw so much at me that I could not um, I was not in charge of my life anymore. And that was very important for me because for someone like me who's been a nerd all her life, she's planned her entire life, I always had this feeling I'm in control. Everything is in my hands. I know what to do. Yes, I'm praying to Allah, but I could not understand that being a slave means I don't have control. My concept, my belief was that I'm doing my prayers, but I'm not a slave. You know, I have complete control of my life. I make my decisions. I have that power. Because, of course, I didn't really understand Islam even now. I didn't really understand Quran or, or Tafsir or anything. And so the next 15 years was Allah's way, I guess, of teaching me that you don't have control. You never actually did have control. And so when it was one test after the next and you're trying your best to take control, you're trying your best to keep things 
together, there comes a time you're so exhausted, you just let go. And that's what I did. I just let go. And I, and I, I remember I was down in sajda and I just told Allah, I cannot do it anymore. Um, as I try to control one thing, something else breaks apart. As I try to control that thing, a third thing just breaks apart. Nothing is in my hands. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, I became one of those examples, you know, I, I don't know if you have, have ever seen this, in your khandan, sometimes you have one person who's, who becomes an example because everything bad starts to happen to that person. And everyone in the khandan looks and says, oh my God, I feel so sorry for her or for him because it's like, it's a life of misery. And I became that khandani example because everything was going wrong for me and I couldn't control anything. So from having that perfect childhood, that perfect life and, um, you know, in, up until the age of 22, everything just went downhill after that. And so I remember I uh, stopped teaching. I just felt that I needed a break. And while I was trying to um, overcome my own issues, my problems, find the answers to questions, I just still would not go near Quran. Until one day, I was just surfing through the net, and um, I saw this video of Dr. Israr, which was, I think, 15 or 20 seconds long. And up until then, I had heard a few uh, things from Dr. Israr, and I didn't really, it didn't appeal to me because his Urdu was very, very complex, and you know, he has this very strong, tense kind of a tone. So I just felt as if, you know, maybe he's scolding me, you know, because I'm, I'm a bad Muslim. So it just didn't appeal to me. Um, and so on that, on that occasion, you know, it was just that moment when my heart was in pieces and I was trying my best to keep it together, but I just kept falling apart. And I didn't know, but my heart needed to hear something. I didn't know that, but Allah, of course, did know that. And so um, at that moment, that 20 second clip, which was about test and hardship, but, you know, he explained it in reference to a verse of the Quran. And it wasn't something um, very, very difficult to understand. It was actually something very simple, common sense. But it was exactly what I needed to hear. And the minute I heard it, I remember I switched it off and um, I downloaded the Dr. Israr app. And I started my tafsir um, that very night because I told you I'm one of those people when as soon as I put my mind to something, then I have to get it done. So I would wait every night for my kids to go to sleep. And then I would start from 10 till four in the morning, just writing notes, writing notes. I would listen to Dr. Srar and I would start writing notes. And it, was, and it was my miracle because I am the worst at Urdu. And he is the best at Urdu. So how I was able to understand him, I still don't know, but I started writing notes. I got so much into it that I started studying the Torah and Injil as well, that you know, let me make comparisons. And you know, as I dived into it, I just started getting answers to all my questions. Every single question that I had started to get answered and it was answered to my heart's satisfaction. And then it wasn't just the, the answers to my questions, but then so much more was being introduced in this book that I was just overwhelmed. And I realized this book is so intellectual, it's nothing, it's nothing like what I thought it would be. You know, it is packed with wisdom, packed with all kinds of knowledge and hidden messages. And you know, it's like you're, you're going through, um, you have started a treasure hunt. So you're trying to find the treasure and as you get closer, it becomes more and more exciting. That's what I started to experience. And so I remember that it took me nine months to study the tafsir from Dr. Israr. And I wrote notes and, and I was writing notes. I was making comparisons with other books. I was making comparisons with other um, scholars as well. And then I just had this need that I have to share this with someone else. You know, this is just, this is profound and I have to share it. And of course, nobody wanted to listen to me. So I remember calling my friends at Lums and I said, um, you know, is anyone interested to listen to what I have to teach them about the seed? This is amazing stuff, you know, and I have to share it. And I remember there were just two of my friends who said, okay, you can share it with us, but we'll just give you one month because we don't have more time than that, you know? So you have one month and every day we'll give you one hour. So fine, share with us what you have. And I was super excited. So I started sharing my knowledge with them. It was just an hour a day for one month. 
And at the end, um, I remember when it was over, they were, they were baffled. They could not understand how the Quran had so much in it. And then they said, okay, can you start teaching one more time? But now our cousins want to join. And then our friends want to join. And, and then that's how it started. So it started off with two people. Then it started off with four people. Then it started off with 12 people. And then it just gradually took on from there. And I categorically remember that when I finished my tafsir with Dr. Israr and I was about to start, you know, teaching my friends, um, you know, the minute that one month was about to end, my fear would start because I would be terrified that Allah, once this month ends and my friends move away, who do I teach Quran to? I have to share this. I have to keep sharing this. If I don't, I'll move away from it. And I was terrified of that. And then the minute um, you know, that one entire one month class would end, somebody would approach me and say, can you please start teaching again, but can you teach me now? And I was overwhelmed with joy that, yes, let me, let me start teaching you now. So that's how it all started. And um, then eventually I started a Facebook page. Then eventually I got into uh, my book. I wanted to write a book and compile all my notes of tafsir so that I realized, you know, someone who's listening to tafsir will find it hard to write all the notes. It'll be easier if the notes are already compiled. So you just have to read it, listen to the audios and just read. And so that's how it all started out. And I remember praying to Allah and saying, Allah, you have given me so much profound knowledge that I really, really just want to share it with other people. I don't want anything in exchange. I don't, I'm not looking for money. I'm not looking for fame. I'm not looking for popularity. I don't want any of that. I just want a chance to allow people to feel what I felt that night when I was, when my heart was broken and I just heard those 20 seconds of Dr. Star. You know, that connection that I had, that feeling that I had, you cannot even express it to someone. You cannot even share it with someone because it, you don't have the words to describe what you were actually feeling at that time. But it is out of this world. So I said, Allah, I just want a chance to give that feeling to someone else in the same way that I was able to get it through Dr. Israr. But of course, it was coming from Allah. And that's how this entire journey started. So currently, um, I'm married. I have three boys. Um, my eldest is 16. Uh, then my second one is 13. And my last one uh, is four years old. So um, the passion, when you have this passion to get into Quran and to teach it to someone else and to share that knowledge and wisdom and to learn more, then nothing can actually stop you. Having kids or you know raising those kids, even that doesn't stop you. Uh, and so this is what... This is how I started. This is my background. This is my story. I've left nothing out for all of you. Um, and this is what has really been my dream. Um, and what I do want to say is that I cannot thank Allah enough, not just because of the knowledge and wisdom that he gave me, but because this Furqan, this group, this team that I, I've built up, I remember asking Allah that I want to share this, but it's impossible for me to do it on my own. I need friends. I need people to help me out. And my journey ever since then, in the past six years, has been so amazing because I have made friends with people in this Furqan team of mine on Facebook, as well as on Instagram, as well as on you know these WhatsApp groups that, uh, that I've started. Friends who I feel are, you know, they have, they're sharing my vision, they, they're sharing my passion. They are really, really helping me to spread this message to other people. And the most beautiful thing is, I don't know them and they don't know me. I've never seen them and they've never seen me. But it's this strong connection that I have with them that I feel as if they will be there for me and they understand me and we can work together as a team to try and enlighten as many people out there as we possibly can. And that is by far the, the most beautiful miracle that Allah has shown me. So may Allah continue guiding all of us. May we all just be together as one beautiful big family, spreading Islam and the, and the knowledge and the wisdom of, of Islam as much as we possibly can. Um, I hope this introduction has been beneficial uh, because I did realize you all have a right to know who I am and what my background is 
Because when you are studying tafsir from someone or when you are studying Islam from someone, you need to have trust. And that's why I've shared all of my, my entire story with you, um, everything from the beginning, so that hopefully you will be able to have this level of trust in me by understanding who I am and our relationship can become a lot more stronger. Assalamu alaikum.